Uh, Rosario, thank you very much for giving us a few minutes of your time. Tell us where you at and how did you get here? Uh, we are in Long Beach right now. We're par we're on our Bernie bus tour. It's uh, some of my friends who are here you might see in the background. Shailene Woodley, Nomiki Konst. Kendrick Sampson, and Klein Hens, who myself and Ann put this together and came up with this crazy idea to go on this Bernie bus tour um, and traverse California. Shailene was like, well, I've got an RV. Kendrick, we all jumped in, um, and we've been sleeping in it and driving around. We've been to Stockton. We've been to Watsonville. We've been to Salinas. We've been to San Luis Obispo. We've been to San Jose. We've just been all over. We went to the border in San Diego, and right now we're here in Long Beach. Um, on uh, day four, day five um, of this whole uh, amazing expedition of meeting wonderful volunteers and just talking to voters and getting people to volunteer and getting people to think about voting and it's just been really amazing because we're only eight days away from the primary here in California, June 7th. That was great. So tell us how did you get involved with the social justice movement, politics in the United States? What motivated you at the beginning? Uh, well, in the beginning, I think, you know, my... Um, great-grandmother worked for the Ladies International Garment Workers Union um, and so I think the you know coming from Puerto Rico and um, you know the the reality around the lack of sovereignty of Puerto Rico and uh, ability to vote um, and uh, access to um, Good work was a major part of my grandmother, my great grandmother coming over here, um, my grandfather coming from Cuba, um, and uh, working multiple jobs and raising their families. And and um, it was interesting, you know, like that kind of this idea of the work ethic was passed on, the activism uh, part of it was passed on. As my grandmother helped, you know, with labor union marches for my great grandmother, bringing my mother in tow with her. You know, my grandmother used to translate um, all of the um, marching materials and rallying materials and protest materials into Spanish for people so that more people could participate. That passed on to my mom. My mom worked for Housing Works, which did uh, housing, found housing for people who are HIV positive um, in this who were homeless in New York um, she worked for house uh, she worked for women's Inc in San Francisco as a women's shelter um, she was you know working with Eric Sawyer starting you know when act up was just starting um, so like just multiple issues and growing up as a New Yorker myself we grew up and um, my mom moved us and my dad moved us into an, a, a what was an abandoned building there were a few folks living in there we were the first family to move in I was six. Um, we didn't have water, heater, electricity. That the tenacity of the people in the building and my family created that. Um, but it was a it was a better choice than having to live in a slumlord, you know, railroad apartment, um, and wanting to be able to put, you know, use their energy to be able to make a difference, and uh, which they couldn't do, and you know, in, in this other apartment and. You know, we we grew. I grew up around artists then, and people who were coming in from all across the world and all across the country who were trying to find a home for themselves in a, in a neighborhood that was really decrepit and crime riddled. And um, you know, this was during the crack and heroin and HIV/AIDS epidemics, um, and it was the beginning of gentrification. And watching what that did to communities and people who suffered through uh, violence and abuse and neglect, um, you know, calling the police and wondering if they'd ever show up to suddenly. You know the police coming in to clear out, and you know during the police riots, um, to clear out the homeless from the parks and start the gentrification of our neighborhood, and you know, and now the people who suffered through it at its worst and their families survived it now can't afford to live there anymore, um, and they're the ones who made it a community, and so like that's there's just a lot of educations and perspectives that I come at it with, and it's on multiple different issues, and I've always been really active, especially because I've been so inspired by the people I was raised by, which were mostly advocates. And activists and um, and then I just you know so I've been active for many years and then this campaign came around and it was the first time that I really felt the need to endorse a candidate specifically because I felt like the people who were endorsing him weren't getting their fair share of time and energy um, in the press and the media and weren't um, their values weren't being reflected you know the, the the option of just Trump and Clinton does not speak to a lot of people and I even coming from around across the planet you know the second they all get a chance to hear about Bernie they're like oh okay because for a second there we thought we we're gonna have to get a bunker 
um, you know, so why aren't you guys voting for this person? And why isn't he getting more more attention in the media? And I asked, I begged the same question. Um, that's, there's a real viable option there that gives us a lot more leverage and with the issues that we care about and getting some true traction on them boldly, not this incremental pragmatism idea that we're hearing on one side um, that is not going to be useful for us when we're talking about climate change, when we're talking about police brutality, when we're talking about violence in our communities, when we're talking about abuse, when we're talking about the corruptive power of money in our politics and political system that's stopping us from being able to have traction. And this is a grassroots candidate who is only in this campaign because the people have spoken and said, I'll give you $3, I'll give you $27. The idea of this grassroots candidate getting into the White House and being beholden only and solely to the people is radical and not because it shouldn't be radical. That's what this country is supposedly founded on. And you know, it's about supposed to be about we the people. And even though those founding fathers there was a lot of racism, there was a lot of prejudice, there was a lot of sexism, there was genocide, you know, like it wasn't a perfect um, formulation for a country. It was abandoning one country and, and distorting and corrupting another in its, in its progress. But hundreds of years later, we have a real opportunity because we fought and we've had so much humanity to kind of relook at, reevaluate um, what those ideas were when we first started. They, even though they weren't necessarily participating, they still had the vision of saying that every man should be created equal. And, you know, I think that we are we are, have a chance to to rewrite our history and to not even rewrite it, but to um, honor it and to build on it and grow it and, to, and evolve it into something better that's, that's more far reaching and includes more people, including our brothers and sisters outside of our borders. And, um, and that's why I joined, you know, because I've always been about the people. That's what I was raised with. I, w I was raised specifically with poor people helping poor people. And, and being in the position that we are and the influence that we have, we felt like it was our duty um, to escalate our efforts and the issues that we care about and actually uh, step up and say, vote for this man. Not because you're voting for this man, but because by voting for this man, you're voting for all of us. Let me ask you something. Today's Memorial Day. Yeah. How do you connect with that? How do veterans connect with that? I mean, I've seen so many, you know, the veterans for Bernie are very vocal. Um, you have even Congresswoman Tulsi Gubbard, who actually stepped down as a co-chair at the DNC because she was so um, uh, upset, really, at just how the DNC was working. You know, they were only going to have six debates. And, you know, that's not how democracy, a democracy should be working. You know, people should have an opportunity to really see in this idea that this was already decided and that people didn't get a chance to really look at this candidate who is not a war candidate. And instead that we were getting pushed um, someone who has participated and voted for an illegal war. Um, that, you know, she took that very seriously, being a veteran herself and going, you know, my brothers and sisters shouldn't have been hurt and traumatized and died for nothing. Um, we can't, but it's a dishonor to them to just put someone in their place that, that, that caused their demise and not give people an opportunity to look at someone else who is not, who voted against the Iraq war. You know, someone who's on top of that voted against the Patriot Act twice. You know, there's someone who is, you know, when you look on LGBTQ issues, you know, like voted you know, against DOMA, vote, voted against Don't Act, Don't, you know, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, you know, and like all of these uh, things. And he's just been about the people, about, and, and times when it was really unpopular. And, um, you know, when you're looking at someone like her, as Tulsi Gubbard, and the other veterans that I've seen who've gone on there, and they're at protests, and they're showing their missing limbs, and they're talking about peace, when they're talking about, I was sent in an illegal war to kill other people's children, and I don't want to do that to our children, because it's traumatized me and it's hurt other people and it was unnecessary and it's about money and don't get it twisted it wasn't about any other value truly than money and there are real problems out there and there are real issues but diplomacy should be the first thing not put not our children's bodies that we should be throwing into the fray first and foremost and it's really easy for people at the top who are lining their pockets to be able to go and make that split decision but you know you really if you're truly of service you take that very you take that that's a that's a that's a decision you should make very lightly and and not with the kind of conviction that we've heard. You know, for me, when I look at someone like Hillary Clinton, who in 2008, when she was running for office, is going, well, if Iran were to attack Israel, I would drop a bomb on them to obliterate them. She admits that that's a terrible thing to say, but then why say it at all? 
Like, we are actually the only nation on this earth that has actually dropped two A-bombs. And that's not something that should be brought up when you're pandering for votes. That's not what I, that doesn't sound like leadership to me. That makes me very scared. And, and I think it makes a lot of veterans very scared who've been very active and very open about discussing that they do not want her to be president and that they very much want Bernie Sanders to be president because they truly, from his record, his integrity, his votes, like understand that he is someone who would, who would very much hesitate, that, not hesitate on the KXL pipeline, he said no to that immediately. Not hesitate on fracking, he says no to that immediately. He doesn't hesitate on the important things, but he would definitely hesitate on pulling that trigger, on pressing that button to drop bombs or send people into war. And that's something that they value and they are pushing themselves and putting their bodies out on the line to say as veterans we stand with him. I think that's just really, really powerful. And um, on this Memorial Day weekend, I think that's the best way as we're talking about honoring. I have veterans in my family, I have people still in the military in my family, um, friends, and strangers alike. I think it's really about, if you're talking about honoring them, then voting June 7th for Bernie Sanders is a really great way to honor them. You mentioned vote and voting. Yeah. In California, I believe we have registered 1.8 new vo million voters. Mm -hmm. What would be your message to those new voters, especially the young ones that's the first time they vote? Well, I say welcome. You know, I've done voter registration for a dozen years and I can say it's a really remarkable thing, you know, when I've stopped people on the street and gotten them to, you know, stand for a second and, 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 and work with me, you know, you, when you've got that little pamphlet and stuff like that, people usually want to try to avoid you like, oh, what do you want, you know, but if you get their attention and you say, hey, you know, this will take one minute. And, you know, there's this interesting thing, you know, sometimes this hesitation that comes with it. But as soon as it's done, there's something that you feel really connected to. You recognize the stuff in the, the, that you read in the history books you're connected to. And it's really powerful um, to realize that now you're not that what that that you're now making the, our history alive, that it's still being written. And you get to the civil rights movement, the suffragette movement. Now you're a part of building on top of. And there's a responsibility and there's an incredible energy to that because now it's the largest, one of the largest groups you could ever participate in. And, um, and people get really excited about it. I've seen, you know, this election in particular, Bernie Sanders is someone that people have been registering themselves to vote for. That's one of the reasons, again, why I also joined this movement is because I was so, you know, for someone who's worked so hard to get people to pay attention and to register, to get registered, I was watching people do it for themselves and register their friends and family on their own. Um, the technology is there and makes it more easy, but really, honestly, I think he also inspired that. Um, so I would just say thank you so much for that passion, for that commitment, that dedication. Thank you so much for um, putting yourselves out there, not just with likes and shares and memes and creativity, which is so important and necessary, that passion, that, all of that, but also making sure that you actually participate, that, those, that you, when you're marching and doing those rallies, that you're marching to the polls, because that's where it really counts. And even though, yes, there are a lot of things that are going on with voter suppression and fraud and all of that stuff, they can't suppress all of our votes. And if we come out and, and the millions upon millions upon millions, we really show up and make a difference and show them that the numbers that they're getting in, in, in cash pales in comparison to the numbers of the passion of, pe of passionate people in this country who want change. And I think that's our biggest power and our biggest resource. So yeah, it's easy to say that maybe your one vote doesn't count, but if millions of you think like that, that counts. If millions of you think my vote counts, guess what happens? Tremendous change. So I just want to say thank you so much for getting yourselves registered. Now it's time to maybe vote early. I've already voted. I voted last week. Um, but definitely vote by or on June 7th because that's when it's going to really critically matter. And you'll get to vote for him twice if we vote for him now. And then we get to vote for him in the general election. But don't wait till the general election. It's really necessary that you vote now. And understand there's a lot of other people to vote for right now. That's what the political revolution is about, is the fact that, you know, we need to change Congress, that we need to start looking at who our senators are. You know, when people are talking about the Supreme Court justice seat, that's not the only seat that's up for grabs. And when we go into the general election, there's dozens of seats. And, you know, that's the thing, that's the power that we have of just going, if you're not voting with us, then you're not doing your job. Because actually, you work for us. You know, I think that's the thing that's been corrupted as well, is this conversation of thinking that D.C. runs things and that we work for them. It's not the way it works. The more of us participate, the more that we can show them. Actually, we can very swiftly change things around because who wants, a bo who wants to have a worker who only listens to you a third percent of the time? 
if you would fire that person. And if that's what's happening right now, it's time to fire some of those folks. In Iran in 2009, there was an election and the, the, the people's vote were stolen. And the uh -huh. concept came out, where's my vote? And that was very powerful. Mm -hmm. in Iran. Um, thank you very much for your time. And uh, last word, it's yeah. yours. Uh, tell us whatever you wish to tell us. I just want to say how amazing it's been on this journey. I have been active and an advocate for a really long time, and I've met so many advocates and activists who've also been at it for a really long time, and they're recognizing how powerful this moment is to be able to take their issues to the, nat the, the national platform. You know, like, the, you know, when you have a crisis like what's going on in Flint, Michigan, it also allows other people to go, I'm so glad that we're talking about lead in our water because here in California, people are drinking lead water. You know, like, it's it, when all of these different things, Black Lives Matter, the Dream movement, the environmental justice movement, the you know, anti-war movement, all of these different movements have a banner to work under, have, a, have a, a, a leader that they can step behind and grow behind, and that person's Bernie Sanders. And by voting for him, you're giving voice to all of those movements, to all of those issues. And I just want to say thank you so much for participating in that and that know that that work has been happening and will continue to happen. How much how difficult it is to get traction on those issues, though, depends on who our leader is. And so I just want to say thank you so much for, for participating and doing your part and representing your country and your values and your issues and, and, and siding with us on the right side of history and getting some work done, because we need to get some work done. And we really, every single one of you, even if it, all you do is just vote, and you don't get five and ten people, because that's what I'd really love, is for you to get five and ten people to, at least to come with you to vote. But even if you just did your one vote, thank you, because we need it, and it counts, and it matters, and it helps give us all the fuel and, and ammunition we need to work for you. So thank you. You know we have a Democratic convention coming up in July yes. right in Philadelphia. What changes do you think the Democratic Party has to make to accommodate the movement that you're such a big part of? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of things. I think we need to have open primaries. I think that we need to uh, reevaluate our superdelegate system. Maine's already banned them. They won't exist in Maine in 2020, I think is really great. Um, I think that we really need to do automatic registration. I think we need a lot more people participating. I think that we need to uh, start really looking at how um, we count votes in the way that we do them and really making them more secure so people can feel good about their votes and know that they really matter. Um, I think that, you know, we've got to have money out of politics, first and foremost. You know, these lobbyists, they shouldn't be in having such influence. I think that that's the most corrosive part because it stops people, leaders, from being able to go into office because they can't afford it. It stops people from being able to hear about it because we're spending all our money on advertisements rather than help. Imagine if how our system worked was people fixed up parks or roads to say, I want your vote, so look, I fixed your road, I fixed your school. I fixed this hospital. That's what, I, that's what I'm going to show you in my ad, is that these are the things that I've done with the money that I've raised to show you how much I care and how I want to be of service. And then you compare that, like, then everybody wins. Right now we're spending billions of dollars on these campaigns that are lasting two years, which are theater. And everyone's just lining their pockets and funneling money through each other. And at the end of the day, most of those candidates don't win. All of that money went into ads, so the, you know, major media outlets got a lot of money out of it, but the American people saw none of it. But then we get compromised and said that we can't have universal health care, we can't have education, we can't have so many different things, but we have money for war and we have money for advertisements. Like, it's really ridiculous. So I think we've really got to reform what's going on in the DNC. And I think it's interesting because what we're hearing is that we've got to conform that we've just got to fall in line, that it's about party unity, and it's like, no, it's about the issues. It's about the people, are not going, profit, are you but going people. going to Philadelphia? I'm absolutely going yes. to Philadelphia. One milli to Philly at the least. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.